that's the end of the Sabbath again for us. We have been out for the last four or five hours and it started getting very cold. So we were doing the section for what we're recording and we'll be releasing that in the days ahead. We've been trying to get a grip on what's happening in the world and world events. So I was looking at just a clip before we started about this flag day, Jerusalem day. It actually goes on for a week, but the big event really was on Thursday night. Now you'll be hearing more about that in one of the other videos, but since we're coming to you live for all of our viewers that are members of our church, it would have been real easy, Julian, for us just to go find some place to get warm because it's been cold here and not even have another service because we've had four sections of videos that we shot today. But I just couldn't do that in good faith, knowing that some of you take time out of your day to see what's happening. So we want to update you on what's happening here in Jerusalem and some of the things that we have noticed. There's a passage of scripture that we're going to be going over. It's going to be in Jeremiah chapter 2. We'll be reading out of the New Living Testament. So we want you to our translation, not New Living Testament, New Living Translation. And we're going to expound on that bit by bit. I'm a firm believer that every person who has a sincere desire to know God will find him and know him through knowing the things of the Lord and applying them to their life. And Julian, we talked a lot about what was going on. Like I said, it's going to be up and released in the future about Flag Day. And we didn't realize that this was going to be happening while we were here. We thought it was going to be the 15th of May, which means the 75th year anniversary of the, the nation of Israel. But that really wasn't what it was. It had to do with occupation and freedom and, and uh, the wars, etc. And I'm not going to go in here and give a big history because right now I don't remember it. <laughs> And uh, if I was going to do a history class, I would have reefed myself on that one. But, you know, the, the thing is, you can't cite us for being real, right? We thought about it, and I, I thought, you know, this is kind of a good thing. Let's go down and see what's happening. I'd been hearing from several different resources that we had to be concerned about there being rockets going off and fighting in the streets and so forth. And so... I felt like if anything was going to go off, I was going to be out there in the middle of it. I would be there to help people who might be struggling or whatever capacity that I could do. So at first I was going to stay in and Je uh, Julian and Stacy, I asked them to go down to the Western Wall. Now in this march, I will tell you this part's bits and pieces. They have two different sections that come into the old city which is to the Western Wall. The young men would go in first and they would go through Damascus Gate. And I don't even remember if the young women went through Zion's Gate, but they didn't go through Damascus. That's a detail I should have probably looked up before I started talking about this. Now I want you to understand the old city is divided into segments. Basically, you have your Jewish, Armenian, Muslim, and Christian. Those are the main big quadrants that the old city is divided into. And it's very sectionalized, so you can pretty much go through one section and know when you're going into the other. It is very well known that the Damascus Gate is actually the Muslim area, the Palestinian area. Now the shop owners will have their things out selling just like the rest of the groups that are there. It's a tourist trap. So you can guarantee it's going to be like being in Mexico on a market street. Going to be a lot of haggling and exchange back and forth. But we thought it was quite interesting that of all the gates that are there in the old city, and I think there's about seven of them, that the one they chose to go through is the one in Damascus. And we thought about why would they do that? This is a Jewish nation. Why didn't they go through the Jewish quarters? Why did they not go through one of the others, even the Christian quarters? Why would you go through Damascus? Now, you would have to understand the hostilities that are displayed. We have 
the battle between the countries. But we don't seem to realize that this doesn't all line up to real realism. So I asked Stacy and Julian to catch the train and go on down to the old city. And they kept us posted about where they were. And I finally said, you know what, we're going to go down too. We were hoping that we would catch the train, but we missed it. Ended up having to walk down to the old city. And there were thousands and thousands of people everywhere. There were all kinds of venues going on, not just at the old city, different kinds of, I guess, parties and dancing and all this in celebration. So when Stacy and Julian went down to the gate, they came prepared. And since they're not aligned with any news organization, they could get a better perspective about what was going on. So when they did, uh, I'm going to let Julian tell about what they saw, and you can't see Stacy, but she's going to chime in, I'm sure, uh, and when the time approaches. So tell them what you guys experienced when you popped on the train and zoomed down to Damascus Gate. I had um, I had watched a couple of videos what what happened in 2021 on the flag, you know, flag march, and that's when they had the 11 day conflict they had it started on that day, and. When the news is kind of skewed because they they only show you that okay this happened because they had the celebration, they didn't tell you why. It was just because the celebration, and then just they started getting conflict between the the Palestinians and the and the Israelis. So we're 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 skewed by that. We're just going through that, you know, going through those videos. I'm watching. And I was like, okay, oh, this is what to expect. Was like, okay, but it was far from reality because we uh, we got there. And on the gate, Damascus gate, all the media was there, all the world media was there. You had the, you know, the heavyweights, those world news and all that. They were there. And so there was a bunch of cameras, so we were like, we're probably not gonna get anything here because everybody's here already. So let's go inside and see what, ha what happens. And then we'll go to make, it a, make, our, make our way to the wall eventually. But as we're going through the streets, to that Damascus gate goes in. We're going through that alley, that on that street, and we started seeing people already getting given some conflict. You know, they were they were they were they were like not really going at each other, but they were already talking. You know that you know they didn't agree with each other what they were saying. But we just passed by, and then we just you know kept going, and then we came back, and that's where we started hearing some of the conversations they were talking about, and that's when we started noticing that. Really, the the Israelis they were antagonizing the the Muslim, well, not the Muslim, but the Palestinians, well, the Muslims. They were they were antagonizing, them. and as we got more, where the there was a bunch of people that you know police of presence was there. There was a bunch of them gathered up, so we got there, and we started you know I got the camera and I started you know taping everything whatever they were doing, and that's when I'm noticing that that's when I started noticing what they were doing, and I got enraged when I was when I saw everything they were doing because. You had the split on two streets, and on one street, one this way, it was like they had it sealed off. And part of that was all that of the Palestinians, their shops and all that. They had it sealed off. And some of the people that actually lived there in the city, they lived there. So there were some people coming in, the Palestinians trying to get to that gate. I mean, they're gated off. And there was the police there, and they wouldn't let them through. They would ask me where they were going, and and that. And they will let them out, but they will ask them to go a different way, not to Damascus Gate, which I find it kind of odd. Was that why not? You know, they're just, they're just going out about their business. Why? And some living there. Yeah, why wouldn't they let them do that? But no, they were shopping them out to you. Know, go, you can't go this way. Go that way. And this and that. So they were just kept on going that. So when people were complaining about it. Some Palestinians were complaining. Oh, hey, what's this and that? But anyway, so they kept doing that. And the other thing they were doing is that that this was a police, Israeli police. So anytime a Palestinian will come by, I guess they can tell who they are because they said they didn't tell us anything, they didn't bother us, or they wouldn't bother anybody. There was the white light skin or anything like that. They wouldn't bother nobody. They would just let us do going on about our business. But anybody that will see, I guess they they know who they are now because they will ask them something and they, I guess if, if they were who they were, whatever. And when they'll find out they were Palestinians, they would just grab them and shuffle them off and attempt to go there the same way they were shoving off all the Palestinians. And everybody else could do whatever they want, but except the Palestinians, they couldn't. They wouldn't. They couldn't do that. They would just go 
they was like said they will make them go out go a certain route and to me like so i started getting mad about that because like i said okay these people they live here i was they're not doing anything and they're not and they're being treated like that they are being mistreated and they were just and you could i mean you could see it on the police's faces yeah they were just they were just brutes i mean no other way to put it you know there was just and that's something that i started thinking about because the media they never show you that mm -hmm. the media never show you that they were they were antagonizing and the they closed all their shops all the palestinians their shops they closed them because what happened last time when they started watching more videos of it is where the because most of this were kids most of the march was kids you know teenagers and that as they were going to the shop last time, they were antagonizing the, the Palestinians, all the shop owners that were antagonizing all that. That's what led to all that scrimmage and whatever they had, you know, the conflicts. That's what started the whole thing. That's what triggered the whole thing because they were starting antagonizing them and all that. And so I guess that's what this, this time they were closing. They closed all the shops. They made them close it. But the odd part about it was that anything, anybody that was, whether it be Jewish or Christian, whatever, their shops could be open. Cause there were some shops open see that was kind of odd too because like why would they make them close their shops but everybody else could have their shops open so it was it was something that we never saw i never saw any of those videos showing that and the other thing was when you were talking about antagonizing the jewish people would go up and verbally attack yeah. the palestinians yeah. or the the muslim and to me, how are you greater than someone else? And why do you have to be vindictive and ugly? I don't understand that because I can guarantee you that those shop owners and those that live in that region and work obviously in that same area were not involved in this outrage. Mm -hmm. And I have to go back and say, what ignited the response? I don't believe that they just up and decide they're gonna start killing innocent people. But should you walk into their mosque and their sacred territory, you're asking for problems. Yeah. You're inviting a, a rebellious behavior. And some of these people do not have any regard for anyone. Of course, they don't have a problem with a foreigner because we're the economic part of it. We help contribute to their economy. So people coming from other countries would not be near as um, critical because we're vital to their existence and commerce. Now the thing you need to understand about the old city, there are multiple ways in it, like I stated, through the different gates, but they're not always smooth ways. Uh, there's a couple of them that you don't have a lot of steps, but the majority of them, there was a ton of steps. And I find it kind of interesting because I'm thinking about the Damascus Gate. It is one of the more direct routes to the Western Wall, but there's part of that Damascus Gate that is a lot of steps. Yeah. And I noticed that when we went to leave, a lot of the Jewish people went a completely different way that had no steps. It was a steep climb, but would have been very smooth going into it. Right but they didn't choose that and so then the part that got to me was they're antagonizing making accusations and in one case julian has a video of it they're accusing a woman that wasn't even a part of all of this and they ignite that anger and so immediately you see resistance but you see the media is not going to do that the media was only there to take videos should there have become an outrage a fight a, a, you know but, weapons being fl uh, dropped or whatever. They weren't there to see any peaceful behavior or any interaction that was positive. It's got to be a negative spin if it's going to be anywhere at all. Right. When you got there, you guys went through the Damascus Gate. We went through the Haffa Gate, uh, or Jaffa, however you want to say it. And that's where there's a lot of steps and there's a quite difficult to get down through there. But the what side we came in on, there was no media, no mm -hmm. world international mm -hmm. media anywhere. Mm -hmm. You had a couple of independent individuals who might have had a YouTube channel or been on a channel somewhere. But where we were at, there was no media. So to me, the advantage point wouldn't have been to see if it was going to break out chaos, but the advantage point would be let's show the peaceful gathering mm -hmm. 
of the people and how they were dancing and uh, visiting and, and all of this. But it was like they were hungry for blood. They wanted to be the first to get that shot that shows that this thing is going to explode. And the whole region is built on tension that has been brought in by politicians. The politicians have made sure that there was civil unrest. One of the gentlemen that we met last night, our taxi driver, he said this was supposed to be a Jerusalem for both nations, for the Palestinian or the Muslim and the Jew. But the government is only to the Jewish side and not taking into consideration the Palestinian side. Well, wouldn't that right there at the core level of operations, wouldn't you think that would stir up turmoil if your government that you've got selected over this area is not concerned about the overall public? We see that in the United States with your main parties of the Democrat and the Republican. We've got two old codgers that don't have a brain. They may have money and they may have had power, but they're they're kind of shriveled up and old. And we've got these people constantly in the news because nobody wants to do any investigation about other possibilities. We have a vice president who's as stupid as she comes, who can't ask an important intelligent question. The whole political arena in the United States is horrid. And yet we can't find any governance in local city, state, you know, um, Congress, I would say just the whole, the whole overall doesn't really care about you and I. They don't care that our gas prices are up, our food is beyond price and recognition, that people are stalemate and trying to exist. They can't live off the, the paychecks they make. So let's just open the floodgates and bring all of the illegal immigrants in from all countries to take what little bit of jobs that we might have. I've got a lot to say about that. I am a citizen of, uh, a resident of Mexico. In order for me to become a permanent resident, I had a set of requirements that I had to go through. I had to prove my financial stability. I had to prove a number of things, and it took five years for us to get this legalization, to come into the country to live as citizens. To me, Although it might have been a comprehension problem with language, the directive of how we needed to enter the country was pretty well laid out. And I know that for the Mexican people coming into the United States, Julian, you went through far more than what we went through because you came in as a young boy and you are a legal citizen of the United States, but you still have to go through so much. Yeah, the process, yeah. But the other thing that I find kind of odd right now, because they have the sort of like open borders right now for illegal, you know, people to come in like that, but not for Mexicans. Really? They don't have Mexicans. They, they don't. I mean, it's just, when they process you, they ask where they're coming from, you know, if you're like, like uh, the South America, they will let you in. Or Guatemala or something like that? Yeah. But Mexico, they won't. They it's, not won't. Open for, it's not open for Mexicans. It's and, kind and, of wild. Yeah. And it's crazy because to me, if you have never been to Mexico, really into the interior, you don't realize the poverty level. However, I'm going to insert here, having been back and forth in Mexico for 12 years, we've got a pretty good feel for it. The propaganda, again, will tell you Mexico's dangerous. It's loaded with cartel that's ready to shoot you at any given second. That is a lie. We have that in the United States. We have that kind of drug violence in our own country. There is no war on drugs. They like to lock you up because they make money off of each prison individual, prisoner, and the longer they can keep you, the more money the private sector makes. Come on, I'm not a political person, but I'm going to say I am here to talk at you about what is fair and what is right. We want to put banners up about Black Lives Matter, This Lives Matter, all lives matter. The integrity and character that should be taught at home is completely not there. The 
Principles in schools are not there as far as values. No one is getting lessons on how to be kind to one another, and I can be kind to anybody regardless of their background. I will not be rude, disrespectful, and mean. I will not agree with your principle and your ideas on many parts, but I will never be unkind and rude to you. I don't care if you are gay, lesbian, transsexual, transgender, upside down kangaroo. I don't care. I will be kind to those who are round about me because I'm an example, an ambassador of the love of God. So my personal conviction is my personal conviction that I live by. I'm not going to cram it down your throat. And I think that we're making a grave injustice to do so. We heard how terrible Mexico was. And I remember my sons were both extremely upset because my mother, I moved her down there first, and we followed suit to go back and forth for a number of years. And they would say, Mom, you're going to get hurt down there. There's the cartel, and, and you know, it's painted a very horrible picture. Now, I'm going to insert something right here. If you don't want the Mexican to come across that border, you Americans who own these companies, start paying them a decent wage. You're paying them $75 a week to work six 12-hour days, and they're not making but $75, and you take those very same berries, and you charge me five, six, seven dollars for a small container, while these people don't even have heat and even shoes on their feet. So if you want to make a difference, what you need to do is talk to these corporations that took our work to Mexico and said, we're going to pay you slave wages. That's where the injustice is. That's why people are coming across the border to get where they can get some kind of living. The bad part is they don't realize that our cost of living is through the roof. Mm -hmm. We have to pay all of these taxes. We have to pay for the electricity. They pay for water once a year. We pay for it every month. And don't dare water your grass because you're going to pay an increase the next month. The electricity it can be costly depending, but many things on that part of the border are not with electricity. So we have a skewed opinion about Mexico that is far from accurate. There are good people of every nation. Mm -hmm. There's good people of every culture. Just because a few people are vicious and vindictive, ugly and hateful, does not mean that the entire nation is that way. When are we going to stop and evaluate people for people? And the way that I look at it is, listen, if you're going to be an ugly demon, I don't want anything to do with you. So I'm not going to lose any sleep over your crazy behavior. That's your choice, not mine. You're going to have to start becoming independent in your thinking and in control of your own faculties, not controlling others by the fits you throw or the anger that you've in, embraced, but looking at it as the fact that we are created in the image of God. Our skin may be of different colors for different regions. I'm not God. I didn't determine that. He did. I think it's one of the greatest tests of character that there is. My mother was raised in a town that was extremely prejudiced. And being black in that community in Oklahoma meant that you had to be out of town by sundown. Now, my mother had these prejudices in her and would make comments about people of black. I never could see color, and to this day I can't see color. I thank God for that. I believe the reason that God allowed me that way was because I was raised on the Navajo Reservation, at least for the first 19 years of my life. And the Navajo was the common person, and I just assumed I was like everyone else. I didn't look at me as being different. You know, as I said, we have an ending background, but I'm just as white as they come, and people don't accept the fact that that doesn't mean I'm really an Anglo-Saxon. I have you say that. Mm -hmm. So we have this ideology and it's, it's dictated to us by your media, by influencers. 
I'm even going to go so far as to say this thing with um, the King of England, Charles. He had a number of people bow down to give their allegiance to him. There was not enough characters in society that said, I'm not bowing my knees to any man. But instead, this man who has a bad reputation, his family comes from a horrible reputation, he's been guilty of many things, they're going to pledge their allegiance to him. And then to look at this Harry and Meghan situation, that's an atrocity. When you think that these spoiled people think they're entitled to have recognition and fame, and yet get all worked up whenever they have the the residue of paparazzi taking pictures. You put yourself out there to do that. Are you that stupid that you didn't have a clue that if you were going to be parading around that you're some great celebrity, there would not be a recourse? You can't tell me that you're that ignorant. You thrived on chaos. If that would not be the case, why didn't Meghan Markle make an amends with her family instead of being some kind of snotty, demon-possessed witch, and you can quote me and send this to her. And Harry's just as guilty for being a drug insane maniac as the next one. So if I'm listening to what they're saying, these people aren't even worth my time of reading, but yet they're constantly thrown on the page. Constantly people have to say something about them. Get your voice for yourself for principles and what's right, not by what somebody has influenced you through. Get your facts. Yesterday, when we were talking to our taxi driver, he said, I'm going to tell you some things. And he talked about how corrupt our nation was. And I knew this. I knew it exactly. I know who the big players are in that field. I know those that censor me and won't let this stuff get out. I know that. But he said, don't take my word. Look it up for yourself. Now, this is a Palestinian, an Arab, that's saying this. Don't take my word. Look it up for yourself. And told about some of the most wicked atrocities that have taken place in this region. And we have bought into it. Can I ask this question of you? We hear about anti-Semitism. And we say the Holocaust was the core of that. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not in the age of the Holocaust. It's come it's gone, it was horrendous, but it's the focus of the world on the injustices that were given out. But what about the Vietnamese? What about what happened in Vietnam? You never griped about that. You never threw a flag out because we were getting oil from countries that were considered, I would say, terrorist groups because we had something to gain financially. Get your principles set on what is right and not what is a financial gain to you to become successful. Get your values established. When we hear about anti-Semitism, I said to them, it's, there is not an anti-bone in my body except anti-devil. I can't stand him. I can't stand Satan. I hate him. I despise him. I cannot handle what he has done to the world, and therefore that's the reason I go online and I'm vocal. You have got to step back and ask yourself, who are you? What is your identity? Are you basing everything you know off of what was established in your youth? Or have you come to grip with some things from your own personal experience? Julian, Mexico being looked in the United States as a very derogatory thing to have Mexicans across the border. Uh, I can't say that, obviously, <laughs> we're friends. Mm -hmm. But way before that, I had a large number of acquaintances and friends who are Hispanic. I do feel very strongly about this, that when you come to a country, that it's vitally important that you try to learn the language to the best of your ability. And to me, when I went to Mexico, I stress very strong Learn the language, learn the culture, learn, learn, learn. And the majority of the people ignored me. And yet, they didn't know all the time I was learning Spanish. And I could understand and comprehend a large portion of it. So when my 
youngest son was still alive, we went to Mexico and we sat down and I began to talk the, the Spanish language to the people that was there. And he stopped and he goes, Mom, I didn't know you could speak Spanish. I said, well, I didn't just tell them to learn it. I came in to learn it myself, to set the example. I have two young women, both of them my granddaughters, who are fluent in Spanish. And I'm so proud of that they, they did it. They have good acquaintances in that community because they have the ability to relate in the language, in the culture. And to me, that's far greater testimony than expecting the Mexican people to embrace my Americanism. I wouldn't want them to do that. They're too good of people. I, I wouldn't want that. And I'm not saying that Americans are all bad. So let me make sure that I clarify that. So I have said this over and over and over. And like I said, we've been going back and forth for 12 years. And somebody asked me, I do understand 80 to 90% Spanish. And I speak 75% of it. I don't do it for a number of reasons. Because when I speak in tongues, I don't want you to think that I learned the language I'm speaking in tongues of. It's more of a protection of the things of God. I don't know the languages that I speak in tongues of. Only God knows. But when they come to the United States and all I hear is Spanish music blaring in our American stores and the disregard for the English language and not even able to communicate, I feel very upset that I came to your country. I lived there as a, temp a permanent resident and I embraced your culture and your language. If you're going to come into the United States, can't you embrace mine, my language, my culture, what I'm comfortable with? Can't you do that? Since you were so young coming into the United States, was it uh, difficult to make that transition into the English language? Not really, but you, you made a point that because this, uh, I mean, I grew up with it and I know a lot of people that feel that way and I always try to say my piece and try to correct them on that because I always felt that, okay, like, if when it comes, I come to the United States and sometimes, yeah, you do get treated bad or different way, whatever's in that. But the way I was looked at it like, hey, I'm in their country. Right. I'm not in my country. So I can't demand things from them because I'm not I'm in their country. And that's why a lot of people a lot of people seem to think seem to have it or think the other way that they think that they can come in and do their own things and that and people have to do respect what they're doing and that. No, because you're in their country. You're not supposed to act like that. And that's what the taxi driver was telling us was saying that when the U.S. has invaded some of the Arab countries and they try to put, bring their democracy into the, the country, said, how can they bring a democracy or something to this country when they don't even know our the, our, the way we live, our culture and everything? Our religion. And he said, it's not going to work. It's, it doesn't work because of that. Because like they, if they would put people in, in, in place that knew or know our culture, know how to talk to us and all this and that, that would be one thing. But when you try to bring somebody, you know, you you take over the country, put somebody there that you want who doesn't even know the culture or anything like that. He said that's when it becomes bad because they treat us different and all that because they don't know our culture. And that's the way I, I, I thought about the same way me going to the U.S. I can't demand things out of this and that. I have to learn the language. I have to do this and that. I have to really follow the rules and everything because I'm in their land. I'm in their country. And a lot of people take that for granted. A lot of people seem to think like, you know, you come into whatever country you come into and I should be very respected. I deserve respect. I, to me, that's an entire mentality. Right, yeah. right. I remember asking you when I was trying to learn Spanish, I remember asking you, do you think in Spanish or do you think in English? Because I was trying to do a word for word translation. And um, it wasn't until I started learning how to speak the language, I realized there's no word for word translation. I could understand now why he was kind of puzzled at my question at time because we had talked about me preaching or teaching in English and you doing in, in Spanish and realized that there is a lot of stuff that is missed in the translation. Mm -hmm. To me, Spanish is a more simpler language mm -hmm. and we've complicated it and yet we don't really understand that 
there are certain ways that each of us were brought up and that culture does play a great part in our life. When we respect one another, we don't go in and try to demand change from one another. You know, when I'm teaching you how to walk with God and how to develop a relationship with the Lord, I'm not coming around browbeating you. It's your option. If you want to listen, great. If not, that's your option. I have never been one to force my belief system on anyone. I know that what God has done for us is far greater than the average person. But I'll never tell you the road you are on will not even deepen and grow the more you give yourself to the Lord in your service to Him. And one of the main things that you must do to be of service to the Lord is watch your attitude. Speak, be kind, show forth the love of God. Let them see something different in you that's not categorized. You know, um, of course, I thank the Lord for everything that I have experienced in this life. I can say there have been great injustices, unkind reactions, not necessarily from a general public, but from within the family. And that's so hurtful. I want it to be when I saw all the things that happened in my life, I wanted to put a, I would say, a, a goal that was higher than what I had been raised. I wanted to set the standard to be the best mother I could be because I did not have that. I wanted to set the standard to be the greatest grandmother I could be because I had a glimpse of that and my grandma Prather, but I didn't have the total embodiment of it. I had bits and pieces and glimpses, but not the whole thing. So I knew there were times I was betrayed by my grandmother. And from that, I learned to be honest, true, and faithful to my grandchildren. Now I have adopted a family because I had no family to speak of. Um, I could say that my biological family, which included my mom, dad, and the three of us, was as if it was a, a faraway land that we existed in. And seeing the things in this life that I have seen, I knew there were things I did not want. I saw what alcoholism did, and I would never drink. I saw what drugs did, and I would never take drugs. I didn't care about peer pressure. I cared about my body as a temple, what I would suffer and go through as I aged. I set those standards, and I'm so thankful that even to this day, although I have lost some along the way, I have been so richly blessed with people who are not blood, but who are my family, have been there through so much that my family never was there for. It didn't matter that we didn't come from the same bloodline. It didn't matter that we're not of the same color of skin. It didn't matter that we had various backgrounds. What mattered was our love was sincere and true, and that that was the way that the Lord expected us to live for one another and serve one another. We serve God by how we treat each other. We are representatives of His kingdom by our actions. I don't ever want anyone to think that I am above them. All I want them to see is the love of God that comes through my life. So even though you haven't had it, you can, by embracing a new road, a new map. You know, I, I've told people many times, I don't look at, at Julian as my assistant pastor, I look at him as my son in the gospel. And I tell people, this is my son, and his wife is my, my daughter, because that's how I feel connected in my heart. It's not something I have to force myself to do. It's because they have been there. When my son was murdered three years ago this month, my family wasn't there for me. Think about it. My son is murdered, and no one picks a phone up to ask me how I am. 
No one makes a phone call to see how they can help. But the people that you've seen online and the people that's a part of this church family have been there for me every day for 35 years. We have embraced each other as a community and we love each other sincerely. So you see, my family wasn't there when I had to bury my son. But this man, he hopped on a plane. Several of the other young men in our church got on a plane and they got to my side as fast as they could. Julian will never understand how much that meant to me. That he was the one who cared for his body in death, stood by my side in life and in death. His, this whole group, those that came in this church as little boys, became men and their families are here. They stood at my side. My daughters-in-law that were there never was at my side. I never got a phone call from my granddaughters that said, Grandma, how are you holding up? Not a word. But from the adopted granddaughters, Nana, are you okay? Nana, I know it's kind of hard right now. Can I do something for you? See, my natural family abandoned me. God gave me so much more than my mind could ever conceive. And you've heard me make mention that recently some family members that I didn't really know that well have come into my life and I have thoroughly enjoyed knowing that they are a part of my blood and I care deeply about every part of their life. You see, you might not have had it as a young person and maybe not through portions that you wished you had, but be what you can be for others. Isn't that the better way anyhow? You know, as I said, it will soon be the anniversary, third year, third year anniversary of my son's death. And the actions that were done during the darkest period of my life can never be repaid. I never want to have to go through that again. And I pray I don't. But I'm so thankful that this group of people don't fake it. They love from their heart. Do they always agree? Not really. But are they always in battle? No, not either. We're not your normal, typical family. We might get a young person who gets his head twisted out of whack or young person, but it's pretty male prod into subjection pretty quick. So what does that have to do? Today, I want you to embrace this complete understanding. We are who God has created us to be, but we're not at our best yet. We still have some growth and development to go. So we'll be passing these cards out before we go too much further in the next days. And I want to read this scripture that, like I said, it's going to come up again in another area. Jeremiah chapter 2. But we will be releasing another portion of this video. And I want to insert right here, many times when we go live, there are other portions that we want to insert and we don't have the ability on the fly, as I certainly do it, to in, in bring those information pieces to you. So, excuse me, when you're watching and you see another video go up, go back and see what we have added to it as far as visuals. The Lord's case against his people. This is Jeremiah talking. The Lord gave me another message. He said, go and shout this message to Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I remember how eager you were to please me as a young bride long ago. How you loved me and followed me, even though you were in the barren wilderness. 
you brought up in an earlier broadcast about people losing their zeal. Can you re-expand on that for me? I said it was like, to me, when I got that scripture, when I read, when I saw the scripture, it reminded me of when, when you first come to God and you have this, uh, you're all in. I mean, your whole being is in. You want to learn about God. You want to, you want to serve God. You want to, I mean, everything, all these emotions wrapped up into one. And you're just all, going all, all in. And that desire, that, whatever you want to call it, I mean, it, it, from the beginning, as time goes by, the more things you learn and stuff like that, and as your walk goes to, you know, more and more further, we tend to lose some of that. We tend to lose some of that along the way. And it's, that to me, that's what the scripture's talking about, because like I said, you know, we do, there's, to me, there's a difference, at least, you know, sometimes I have felt that way to say, I'm not giving everything to God, because like I said, I knew how it was from the beginning, and then all of a sudden, like, there was a, some kind of shift, and then all of a sudden, like, it's like, instead of me going, like, going up like that, it's like, go up and down, up and down, and down, sort of like that. And to me, that's what the scripture's saying, because when we come to God, I mean, we, we're all in. And, and that's very true. And I made reference to this, like I said, some of this you're going to see in the next broadcast as we get them prepared to go out. I thought about when I first came to the Lord in 1969, I couldn't wait to get to church. I needed to be in the church every time the doors were open. And I was so shy and timid. I wasn't one to come home and preach to my family. I just wanted to go to church. Now, my dad uh, was very much uh, the authoritative figure in the house. And you would have thought that when I came to the Lord in 1969, he would have been thrilled that his teenage daughter had made the choice to serve God. But instead, he became enraged. And there were times that my dad would tell me I could not go to church from anywhere from a few weeks to several months. And I had remembered that my grandma had told me when we lived on the reservation that there would be times that we couldn't make it to church. But for us to take our Bible out and read and pray together and at least acknowledge God. So I thank my grandmother for that principle. Well, sometimes because of my ride to church was by a friend and she was the organist. And church back then lasted at times until midnight. And my dad had a curfew for me that I had to be in the house no later than 10 o'clock. When the cuckoo clock struck 10, I would better be in those doors. Now I'm not driving myself. I have no control over that. And the sweet woman that her family picked me up for many years, knew my family very well and even worked close to them. And she knew that my dad would go through this conniption fit and that I would be penalized by the fact she couldn't get me there by the time the cuckoo clock went off. And so many a time I would come in right after it finished striking 10 and my dad would meet me with, you're grounded, you're not going back to church. And I can't tell you how that hurt. Because you see, I had found peace and joy that I had not experienced in my life. And now you're telling me I can't have that. So I just figured I'd do the best I could. I would go in at the time of service I would close my door, I would have my homework finished, and I would open up my Bible and I'd begin to pray and read the scriptures. I knew I was missing song service and I wasn't very good at singing, but I would sing what courses we were singing at church. And the whole time I would think that church was going on, I would be having a little church in my bedroom. And after sometimes weeks, sometimes months, my dad would say, say, God, can I go to church? And sometimes he would say, yeah, I think so, it's fine. And I think sometimes he did that just to tantalize me, to know that some point in time my ride would not get through that door, and once again I would be forbidden to enter the church doors. 
Well, since I wasn't looking Pentecostal with long hair and long dresses and all of this, they seemed to want to drag me down to the altar to pray constantly because I was backslidden when in fact they didn't have a clue what was going on. But I figured I needed a prayer and they needed to practice so it worked out in the end somehow. And another time would come and this time it might be longer. And every time he would say, you can't go back to church, it was like a blow. I don't want to lose God. I can't lose God. And the stab in my heart was that every moment I could be in God's house, I wanted to be there. We were not privileged to have a presence of God like we have in this assembly. We just had church and fellowship, but I wasn't into the fellowship thing, as I said, because I was very shy and I didn't know how to carry on a conversation. Now you know it, I've changed. But that newness of being in God's presence never changed with me. And when you said this earlier today, I thought, how many times do I look at my congregation and say, did anybody else experience his presence but me? Because that newness, Julian, has never left. I'm still so blessed to be able to say I'm a part of his kingdom. So richly blessed. And I hope that as we read these scriptures, that you stand back and you take a good look at yourself and ask yourself, where did you lose it? Where did this cease to be important to you? Where did it just become the way it is? So that was one of the things that I thought was important of what you said earlier. In those days, Israel was holy to the Lord. The first of his children, all who harmed his people would de be declared guilty and disaster would fall upon them or fell upon them. That's what Israel has become. It has become a desolate people without God. To go down to a wall and beg for his presence, but yet totally ignore him in every aspect of that wall. And, you know, we're not here to be critical. We're here to say you don't have to go to Israel to find the Lord. Just start following this channel and start listening to what I'm teaching you and applying it. I mean, I have to say, when we get to the place that, ah, oh, it doesn't matter if I watch service or not, what have we lost? The reality, the genuineness, the care, the concern. And I would go ahead and say the calling of what God wanted us to do and be. Mm -hmm. I, the Lord, have spoken. Listen to the word of the Lord, people of Jacob. All of your families of Israel, this is what the Lord says. And I made the statement in the previous broadcast that just happened earlier today that when I was down there on Thursday night and I'm waiting for maybe a sign for me to do what I need to do for the Lord, and he says to me, my people have forgotten me. Have you forgotten him too? Have you forgotten where he brought you from? You feel like you're so full of pride and arrogance and ugliness if you want to be some kind of martyr, why don't you be a servant of the Lord and not try to be a martyr? He says, What did your ancestors find wrong with me? What did you find wrong with him? What did he do to you? What did he do to you? My son's murder was not at the hands of my God. It was the hands of a wicked individual. Not my God. He never ever meant for there to be harm and pain in my life. But people did it. Put the blame where it belongs. Like when we talk about these other countries. Put the blame at the guilty party. Not at the innocent. 
There are many people of all faiths and all nations that have goodness in them. And I'm reading to you from the book of Jeremiah about Jerusalem and where I'm at right now. What did your ancestors find wrong with me that led them to stray so far from me? You say you love God, but you don't. Look at your conversation. Look at your lifestyle. Look at what you're involved in. And you want the blessings of God? He won't hear you. You can beg, scream, cry, plead. He won't hear you. Many of you know that I've gone through a very difficult time with my health. But never once ever did I place blame upon God. When I became weak, and I have those times from now to now, from time to time because of my activities, I just simply say, oh Lord, please help me. Help me. I never wanted to have an attitude that reflected anything ugly and cruel in this great time of pain. And I trust that I have been the best example that I could be for someone who'd gone through so much. So why do you not love him? He didn't take your dad. He didn't take your mom. He didn't take your business. He didn't take your children. Put the blame where the blame goes. I watched my first husband's life be destroyed through drugs and alcohol. And the drugs and alcohol is the thing I despise and I hate. I literally hate it because I saw the destruction of innocent lives. You pick up your party life and you go out with these people. When you should be teaching people about service unto the Lord, you're too busy trying to be Mr. or Mrs. Popular. Oh, I listened to service. No, you didn't. If you had listened to service, you would apply what I'm teaching you. But you really didn't get it. So what did, what did I do wrong that you want to stray from me? They worshipped worthless idols only to become worthless themselves. When you worship narcissism, the god of self, I know what I want. I want what? Have you ever just fell upon your face before God and said, whatever you want is fine with me? I have. I've lived that way. Yes, I've shed my tears. Yes, I've had my heartache. But I wouldn't give nothing up for what I have today. All the experiences of life, I've learned better how to trust Him than anything. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us safely out of Egypt? I thought about that as I sit there at the Western Wall and I wanted to see the hunger and desire that people had. I wanted to see that. I realized that there was so much missing. Not that I went to be critical. That wasn't my purpose. I went in good faith, trusting that I was going to see something of that nature. Julian, pick it up from there where it says, um, they did not ask where the, the Lord is, verse number six. They did not ask where is, the, where is the Lord who brought us out safely out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, a land of deserts and pits, a land of drought and death, where no one lives or even travels. And when I brought you into a fruitful and in, to enjoy its bounty and goodness, you defiled my land and corrupted the possession I had promised you. The priest did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who taught my word ignored me. The rulers, the rulers turned against me and the prophets spoke in the name of Baal, wasting their time on worthless idols. Therefore, I will bring my case against you, says the Lord. I will even bring my charges against your children in the years to come. Go west and look on the land of Cyprus. Go east and search to the land of Kedar. Has anyone ever heard of anything as strange as this? 
Has any nation ever traded its gods for new ones? Even though they're not gods at all. Now think about it. This is Jeremiah talking. And did we change our God for someone else? Yes. We did. The Christian world changed it to Messiah. Jesus. That's who they professed was the Messiah. Never realizing that over history, there were 12 different Messiahs that came on the scene. You don't know your history. And they're not going to teach you this in Bible school. Because then you're going to have to question a lot of what you've been taught. But it says, they brought gods in. You brought gods into your houses. I brought gods into my houses. And I've repented continuously over that. Because I thought that I was honoring God through these unholy days. And it was only pagan rituals and deities and, and demonic worship. Although we thought it was Christian, it wasn't. This is how the Christian world replaced Adonai. Replaced him with another God. So that he would not receive the just credit that he deserves. We replaced him. We changed him. We embraced everything that incorporated other religions and paganistic practices. But we totally abandon Adonai. Why? What did he do to you? What did he do to you? He offered you blessings. If you just kept that first commandment, that he would always be first and foremost. He would always be the most important, I would say, individual. That's the best way for me to say. I don't want to say power source or alternative whatever. But my God is the creator of all the universe. And he deserves our respect universally. When I see the disrespect at the Western Wall, you're not supposed to turn your back on the Western Wall when you go up to pray. And many, I'm going to say countless thousands of people, turn their back. They say his holy presence is always there. I don't believe that. Because if his holy presence was always there, there would not be such great disrespect, it being the Sabbath, the day that was set aside to worship and honor him. I did not see that. And I've been down there a number of times, not just this time, but in prior, when we was here in 2017. So we changed, our, we changed him. We've replaced him. Our own personal goals are more important than what he wants from us. Why? Why? Has any nation ever traded its gods for new ones, even though they are not gods at all? Yet my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. The rabbis who began to teach the people were not walking with God. They were not true prophets of the Lord. But they changed the writ. They indoctrinated them in a lot of other unnecessary details that they will fight to the grave over. As I watch them walk through the street, some of them have the big tall hats and the curls coming down and some are wearing little yarmulke and, and some are, you can see the prayer shawls. And, and I don't know about you, Julian, but when I see those prayer shawls, that irritates me. Because that symbolizes that you're a man of prayer. But I've watched your riotous behavior. How can you profess that you're a man of prayer when in fact you don't pray? I never saw any of those young men gather together and pray. Oh, they danced and they sang and they, they did their fellowshipping thing. But not one cried unto the mighty God of heaven. Not one. And I'm going to say this. I didn't even see the rabbis do it. Right. When that rabbi got up on Thursday night and he started his prayer, not a person where I was at even acknowledged in silence and respect for this rabbi that he was in prayer. Not one. And I have footage to prove what I'm talking about. And yet, this is a holy people. I am unfortunately here to say far from holiness. But they're not the only ones in that category. We all need to examine our own selves. Go ahead and pick up from there, Julian. Verse number 10, I think, 12. 
The heavens were shocked at such a thing and shrink back in horror and dismay, says the Lord. For my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me. Okay, stop there a minute. He said they've done two evil things. I'm going to address this to people universally, not in specific faith, but individuals. They have abandoned me. Did you hear that? Abandon me. How did we abandon him? We, we ceased to acknowledge him in all of our ways. And everything we did, we did not pay attention to our testimony, our example. Abandon. Two ways. The fountain of living water. Now what else have they done? And they have dug themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. So they have become senseless. Uh, not important. They can't even give breathing water. The leadership of Christianity is a, is a disgrace. The, I want to say, <laughs> those that like to be paid for a lot, um, hirelings. My first husband made a statement to me many years ago, and I will never forget it. He said, honey, you make a tremendous pastor, and I make an excellent hireling. Because you have the care and love for people, and I just want the money. He didn't occupy my pulpit, by the way. Go ahead, Julian. The results of Israel's sin, 14. Why has Israel become a slave? Why have they carried away as plunder? Strong lions have roared against him, and the land has been destroyed. The towns are now in ruins, and no one lives in them anymore. Egyptian marching on their cities of Memphis and Tephanes have destroyed Israel's glory and power. And you have brought this upon yourselves by rebelling against the God, your God, even though he was leading you all the way. I got a question for you. What would happen? This is just a theoretical question. If all of a sudden people from both sides, the Jews and the Palestinians, what if they decided they would honor their representation of God and not try to destroy each other? What would happen if true men rose up and said, it's enough. This is not what God created us for. We don't need to be lords over each other, dictators, unkind and cruel. Would there be a change of attitude? I believe there would be. Mm -hmm. Would there not be a change of venue? Should these men who were supposed to be men of prayer, men of God, if they believed in the God they serve and they just didn't go through ritualism, then they would be praying the repentant prayer for the world and for this nation. But they don't. It's all about power and control. And to me, how are you honoring the God that created you? all about your importance. I, I just wondered, when I looked at that group of men across the front last night, what would have happened, Julian, if one or two just decided to get down and not just stand at a wall and do this and read a prayer book, but get down and fall upon their face and say, Oh God, have mercy on us. A sinful nation to show who has forgotten you. What would happen? Would the rest of the men fall down their face and begin to pray, God, forgive us, for we have forgotten you. What changes would be made universally? How would they become be better citizens for those around them? What if you ever embrace the power of prayer, the power of true repentance? Would that change the situation? And my answer is absolutely. Yes. And maybe that's why these men are too carnal. They're afraid another might come in and take control. Go ahead, Julian. Let's continue to read the rest of this. 18. What have you gained by your allegiances with Egypt and your covenants with Assyria? What good are you or the what good to you are the streams of the Nile? or the waters of the Euphrates River. Your wickedness will bring us its own punishment. Your turning from me 
for me will shame you. You will see what evil, bitter thing is to abandon the Lord your God and not fear him. Think about that. Everyone under the sound of my voice, at some point in time, you've abandoned God. He's just as close as the mention of his name, Adonai. Please forgive me. Please forgive me for not being what I need to be for this world. What changes? What power would arise? Rebelling against the Lord your God, even though he was leading you into the way and the what have you gained for your allegiance in Egypt and your covenants with Assyria? What good to you are the streams of the Nile or the rivers of the Euphrates, the waters of the Euphrates River? Your wickedness will bring its own punishment. You turning from me will shame you. You will see what an evil, bitter thing it is to abandon the Lord your God and not to fear him. People fear the apocalypse, the mark of the beast, the end of time. But do we really fear it? Or are we looking for that to happen? The Christian says one of two things, that before the mark of the beast would happen, the church would be caught away. Right. That's not true. They also say that during the mark of the beast, the church would be here three and a half years. That's not true. Or that at the end, we will be taken out of here. That's not true. You're saying all three viewpoints are not true. That's basically what I'm saying. If you live your life for God daily, does the rest matter? The New World Order and the powers that be that control the scenario, they want you to walk in fear and they want you to believe that the worst is yet to come. But when do we stop just taking the same rhetoric and believing it. When do we stop? I mean, is this all this generation can do is be puppets on a string or even the generations before me? You see, in my generation, they wanted to shut us up so it was better to kill us off. We were involved in wars that we should have never been involved in. I hear people say, thank you for your service. And I appreciate the sacrifice they thought they were making and many did. Some of my relatives were lost in some of these wars. But the question I had was, was the opium in Iraq worth the Iraq war? <laughs> was the fight of other drugs in Vietnam worth the Vietnam conflict? It didn't even get the title of a war. What has been our mode? We fought for oil that we have plenty in our country over. But politicians want to be right. So they're going to change the scenario and constantly degrade and down. I can't control tomorrow. I can't control the future. I can be the little influence that I'm attempting to be in my own little way. But I want us to understand there is so much more we can do. But the first place we need to start is to humble ourselves in prayer. If I were to make a call out to Israel, I would say you men who place yourself in a place of leadership, show them how to pray at the Western Wall. Show them how to live by your example. Show them what's important in the things of the Lord. But I won't say that just for the Jewish people. I will say that for people universally from whatever faith you are, whatever walk you walk down, Let's stop and be the example that God wants for us to be. Is there anything else, Julian, that you would like to add to this? We're not going to read the rest of it. You know, talking about the example, because the, when we're talking to a taxi driver, we obviously said he was Muslim. And one of the things that he said at the end, towards the end, he's saying that, he said, I respect you yes. because you, the way you were talking to him and everything. So that says a lot, the way you treat people, the way you talk to people, the way you embrace people says a lot, even though you might not agree on certain things, 
you can find common ground to start talking about right. things. Mm-hmm. And, right. And I did notice that and, and I at, did the notice that at the conclusion of our conversation, of our conversation with uh, him, I extended my hand. Uh, I extended my he'd hand. Said, I respect he'd you. said, I respect I you. I said, I'm a teacher. I said, I'm a teacher. And I'm trying to teach people. And I'm trying to teach I people. respect you. I respect you. And we're so thankful and that we so got an appointment. And gave us his card. And gave us his card. Had a contact. And I thought, and we can't have peace talks. And we can't have peace talks. Because... What? I wasn't trying to make him I wasn't trying faith. to make him a I said faith. I love I God. Said, I love he God. said he loved he God. Said, that he was loved pretty God. good groundwork to start on. Groundwork to start on. Yeah. The rest was insignificant. The rest was insignificant. The importance of the your importance specific belief your specific was not belief what I was, was concerned not, about. What I was concerned about. If you love God, if you love God, then reflect that. Then reflect that. And be what he wants and you to be. be what he wants you to be. An example to the world. An example to the world. Well, as I said, this well, is like our fourth, said, or fifth like service our fourth today, or fifth service today. Because we've recorded because most, we've of the day. recorded most of the Haven't day. Haven't eaten. Haven't and eaten. And now that it's nightfall now here, it's nightfall here in Jerusalem. I think it's going to be a time that we say we're going to get something to eat. Get something to eat. But before closing, just before closing, this would God holy the word of God in your life. In your life. And serve him all the and days of your life. All the days of your this life. has been the Sabbath. This has been the Sabbath. You in the United States are you still in the United States are still in the so Sabbath. So let's keep it holy. So let's him. keep it holy. Thank you him. for tuning in. Thank you for tuning in.